Hello and welcome. Does Latin America really care about what the U.S. president thinks? Barack Obama certainly hopes so as he prepares to visit a region where Washington, D.C.'s influence has taken a serious hit over the past decade. Mr. Obama is traveling to Brazil, Chile, and El Salvador, with whom the U.S. has cordial ties. He's expected to make a Cairo-style speech in Santiago, reaching out to the people of Latin America and urging a new era of ties with Washington. But critics say Mr. Obama's decision not to go to nations that are opposed to the U.S., such as Bolivia or Ecuador, could dilute those efforts. Observers say that the American president has a tough job at hand, considering the history of the U.S. involvement in the region, where it has been accused of toppling democratic governments and supporting military dictatorships. So today we ask, what can the U.S. do to engage constructively in an increasingly distant Latin America? Remember, you can call in with your questions and comments, and we also welcome your emails or text messages onto the show. Joining me now from Durham in North Carolina is uh, political philosopher and Duke University professor Michael Hart. He has co-authored the well-known book Empire, which is a study of power relationships in the era of globalization. And with me here in the studio is Kevin Casas Zamora, who served as Costa Rica's vice president as well as its minister of national planning and economic policy. He's now a senior fellow in foreign policy with the Brookings Institution, a U.S.-based think tank. Gentlemen, I welcome you both to the show. Thank you very much. Rich. Thank you. Professor Hart, if I could start with you, sir, and just ask you what you see as the biggest challenge for the U.S. president on this trip. Well, I, I think you do have to see the trip, like, like you said in the opening, in the context of how different it is for a U.S. president now than it was 10 years ago or even 50 years ago. I mean, you have to remember the context of, of the 20th century and the U.S.'s involvement in Latin America throughout the century was really one of, of uh, dictating political policies and even and even closing down political experimentation. Uh, there are many uh, well-known incidents of overthrowing uh, progressive governments in Guatemala in 1954, in Chile in 1973, a long list goes on. And I think what's really new about this new decade, different, different than, the, um, than in the 20th century, in this last decade, the U.S. hasn't been able to uh, dictate political outcomes. In some ways, it, you might say that the, that the US, U.S. foreign policy has, in some sense, ignored Latin America. But I think in a, in a very positive way, uh, Latin American governments, especially progressive governments in Latin America, have developed um, autonomous political experiments that are outside of either being uh, dictated by Washington or even being uh, anti-U.S. I think that, that really we've entered an, an era in which it's not that the U.S. Right. doesn't matter, but that the U.S. is no longer able to dictate. Well, I want to ask you, Professor, I mean, the, this, the last time I guess there was any kind of uh, high-profile visit was uh, when Secretary of State Hillary Clinton went about a year ago uh, doing a swing through Latin America. And I wondered to what extent she helped perhaps set the foundations for this. Or was that just simply too long ago? Oh, I, I don't know if that, I mean, I just don't, I, I'm not convinced that there is a um, possibility of the U.S. Well, let's let's put it this way: when we look, when we look in the historical context, I don't see the possibility of the U.S. Uh, restarting or retaking up again a relationship in which uh, Latin America functions as the backyard of the U.S. I think that, in a way, Latin American politics have moved on, and I think that's an extremely um, important and and um, and even inspirational in many cases uh, development. Okay. So it's not. I mean, the U.S. can act as partner now, but not but not certainly as. Um, as force dictating okay. political outcomes. Well, I'm going to bring in uh, Kevin Casasamora. Good to have you here, sir. Thank you so much. And I have to ask you why you think uh, President uh, Obama has chosen these particular countries to visit. I know you see El Salvador as being a key uh, country in this particular mm -hmm. visit. Uh, I don't think there's a, there's a single narrative to this trip. I mean, other than the, mm, mm -hmm. you know, the, the obvious uh, story of trying to um, you know, to engage with the region in a more constructive, in a more constructive way. I, I totally agree with with Professor Hard was was saying in the sense that Latin America is not what uh, used to be called the U.S. Uh, backyard. Right. I mean, that has changed significantly, partly because the U.S. Uh, has been looking uh, elsewhere, but also because the region itself has changed uh, very significantly over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, I think in the case of El Salvador, as to some extent in the case of Chile, which is another of the of, uh, of the stops in the in the presidential trip, um, my sense is that there's uh, there's an attempt to recognize that these two countries have been able to come full circle uh, and complete a very lengthy and complicated transition process to democracy, and they both come from very different places because in the case of mm -hmm. 
uh, Chile, you mm, well, what we have seen is is uh, um, that the right after 20 years was uh, uh, given the chance to run the country. Mm -hmm. And the case of El Salvador is exactly the opposite. It's the left that for the first time is, uh, is running the country and very successfully in many ways. So yeah. I guess there's a recognition that these two countries offer some kind of a model in, in the sense of, uh, of creating very vibrant and modern democracies in a region that badly needs that. But I have to ask you though, is to what degree is that uh, interest in, in the Latin American region also because it has been less hit by the recession, its economies are booming, it's, it's kind of a nice place to be doing business with now. Absolutely, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that a good deal of the time that President Obama will uh, spend in, in Brazil in particular will be used to, you know, to play up uh, business opportunities for for the U.S. with what, by all accounts, is a is a booming economy, uh, not just in the Latin American context, but in the global exactly, context. Right. Well, let's bring in a caller. We've got Jackie on the line from Virginia. Jackie, thanks for being with us. What would you like to ask? Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on the uh, Pleasure. Uh, uh, program. I would like to ask the uh, political um, analyst if he feels that Barack Obama's agenda, and in, in terms of the foreign countries, is to uh, control the, their political outcomes, and in fact his agenda is to allow them to be a democracy because I think that in the situation with uh, Libya he didn't really show any um, aggression wanting to invade wanting to control okay. so I would assume that that would be the same position he would take with uh, the Latin American country. Jackie, Thank Jackie thanks for that I'll, I'll ask both of our guests starting with uh, Professor Hart uh, what, what, uh, what's your response to the question there sir? Right my my um, my impression is that it's not uh, President Obama's agenda to to re to reconstitute some some older model of of uh, U.S. foreign policy controlling Latin America, and also I would even add that it's not within the U.S.'s capabilities, mm -hmm. which is I think a very positive thing. And the caller also is right to make the comparison. I think it's a very interesting comparison to uh, the developments of social movements overthrowing governments in uh, North Africa and the Middle East today. The comparisons to Tunisia and to Egypt, I think are very resonant with many of the developments in Latin America in the last decade, to Argentina 10 years ago, to Bolivia in the, in the middle of the last decade, that powerful social movements that overthrow unpopular governments and experiment with new forms of democracy. I think that's something that's really um, common. And in both cases, I guess this is coming back to the mm -hmm. caller's question, in both cases, I think the U.S. is, uh, the U.S. is important, of course, but is not, is in either case, the, the central uh, power. And so, it, it doesn't seem to be an option that the U.S. Uh, try to take that role. Well, uh, Mr. Casasamoto, we get it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that in a way the genie is out of the bottle in, in Latin America. I don't think that the U.S. has the capability to bring back the, the old way of, um, of, you know, running things in terms of their relationship with Latin America. Uh, having said that, I, I think that it's very important to recognize that while there has been political experimentation of, of, of a very interesting type in Latin America over the past decade and a half or so, what we're witnessing in Latin America is really a striking convergence towards the center of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to cut short a very long and complicated story, what every opinion poll in Latin America tells you is that people care about good governance. I mean, people care about governments that are elected in free and fair elections that don't play fast and loose with, uh, with the economy and with the macroeconomic uh, uh, equilibria, and that are able to put in place, and this is a massive shift a massive intellectual shift in Latin America, they are, ma they are able to put in place very effective policies to deal with poverty and inequality. Okay. And that's uh, you know, a massive change that we're seeing, seeing in, in Latin America. Just to give you one very quick uh, uh, figure, uh, out of the 18 countries in the region, 15 countries have seen very significant reductions in income inequality over the past decade. I mean, that's, that's a first for Latin America. All right, we'll get a, a caller on the line as well. Uh, Oliver from Virginia, thanks for your patience. Go ahead, Oliver. Uh, thanks, Liz. Oh. Um, I recently uh, visited South American countries, and um, uh, I noticed a huge uh, Chinese influence. Uh, um, a lot, many Chinese companies there, many Chinese restaurants there, and many, uh, I see many <coughs> Chinese uh, businessmen walking on the street. So even uh, in countries like uh, Bolivia, you see a huge European influence like the German 
in the copper fields investing uh, uh, with the, a huge magnitude in the copper fields in Bolivia. So my question is, can the U.S. Co companies compete with the Chinese companies and the European companies and, how, and mm -hmm. try to establish economic influence? Interesting Thank point there, Oliver. Thank you very much for that. And Professor, I'll mm -hmm. maybe touch on that with you. China's influence has been pretty strong around the world. Africa, of course, you know, and I guess right. now Latin America. And right, it, it has, but of course, in a very, in a very different way than we're used to the uh, old forms of, of imperialism. I mean, that it wouldn't, uh, it's certainly not, it's been uh, an extremely strong economic power and not uh, making the kinds of uh, political dictations mm -hmm. that were, that we're used to from a, from a 20th century form of imperialism. When the, when the, when the, um, when the caller asked, can the U.S. compete with, with China? Of course, I mean, I think that's, that's right, that it's, uh, we have to recognize now that the U.S. is on a different is on a different footing with the countries in Latin America in such a way that it that it uh, can play an economic role, it can act as an economic partner, but cannot act as a um, as a politically deciding force. Okay, um, uh, Kevin uh, Casasamora, I'm going to put a question to you that came by email, if I may, sir. Yes. It's from Mahrus Khan in Stockholm, in okay. Sweden, who wrote in saying, alliances are forged on the basis of reliability and equality. Past U.S. involvement in Chile and Cuba defies both these principles. Considering, the Ob uh, considering Obama failed to follow up on his Cairo speech, how can Latin America have faith in him? Of course, now he, he's planning to do the speech in Santiago that would be a, an echo of that speech uh, he did to the Muslim world in Cairo. But he did actually talk back at the uh, America Summit in Trinidad and Tobago in 2009. He did uh, announce a more constructive relationship and not simply words but deeds. And it's been almost two years. So can, he, you know, can people in Latin America trust his promise? To be entirely blunt, I'm not so sure that people care an awful lot about whether he, <laughs> you know, he cares or not. I mean, I'm being provocative uh, uh, in saying this, but uh, in actual fact, the, the last two decades of, you would call it benign neglect of the U.S. have been rather good for Latin America. You know, c considering the troubled relationship of Latin America uh, with the U.S., historically speaking, uh, that's probably, the, the, the lack of involvement of the U.S. is probably a good thing. Um, whether the U.S. will be able to follow through on the promise of a, of a good uh, constructive relationship with Latin America is, is, is tricky because some of the issues that are truly central mm -hmm. to U.S.-Latin America relations, things like immigration, like uh, 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 narcotics, like uh, trade, they require very politically costly decisions here in the U.S. I'm not sure at all that President Obama is willing to spend a lot of political capital mm -hmm. given uh, you know, given the, the, the current domestic and international agenda that, that Washington has. Okay, excellent. Now, well, I'll get, let's get Val on the line from New York with a, a question here. Val, thanks. Hi. Uh, could the speakers, um, uh, you know, expand a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, the attitude of Latin America and the effect that uh, getting away from the uh, neo-colonialist uh, uh, measures of the, you know, IMF and the World Bank, <coughs> um, have had in, in, in Latin America and also, you know, the uh, propaganda against governments, progressive governments like Venezuela and Bolivia, you know, can, can the, you know, the speakers span about this? Okay, Professor, let's, let's right. go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, the caller is right to, to, to recognize a shift in some ways from um, even, even the formation of leftist practices and leftist ideologies in Latin America from uh, a kind of um, foundational anti-Americanism, anti-USism as, as a leftist position towards the recognition of neoliberalism as um, a, a, an economic package, really, of, of privatization, cutting of social services, et cetera, this, this being uh, the real enemy. And I think in some ways the last 10, 10 years or 20 years, as Kevin has been saying, that these have been characterized by that, by, by a subtle shift, let's say, from the focus on the domination of the U.S. to the focus <laughs> on the domination of this um, supranational uh, economic paradigm. So, in some ways, the I think the ways that the progressive governments in Latin America today are evaluated, especially by the social movements that put them in power, is to the extent to which they have addressed uh, the policies of neoliberalism, the policies of developmentalism that that. Um, that they were put in power to attack, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that, that that shift from anti-Americanism to anti-neoliberalism, and I would also say it's been enormously positive. I think that not only it's been a positive shift of the U.S. not 
exercising and not being able to exercise a political domination over Latin America. It's, in some ways, I think it is my personal view is it in some ways freed the left from from an anti-Americanism. You know, I mean, to to experiment with with other um, democratic ideas that in which the U.S. really plays not an important role either for or against. So I think that that's in some ways part what's at stake here. All right, Peggy's on the line from Maryland. Peggy, go ahead, please. Thank you for taking my call. I wanted to ask your guests that with the recent um, census in the U.S. in my area, um, Latin Americans are on 40 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. Given that the case um, and the U.S.'s desire to exploit everybody's natural resources, are we exporting or importing the labor force? And how is that affecting their home? And with the recent economic downturn, how, what do we do? Okay, I'll give that to Kevin Casasamora. Yeah, that dovetails kind of nicely with something that I said before. Um, my impression is that it is far more important for the U.S. to have a constructive relationship with Latin America than the other way around. And the reason, or one of the reasons, is that if there's one region in the world that has uh, an impact on the daily lives of mm, people in this country is, is Latin America. And the most obvious way in which this happens is through the massive immigration that we are, that we are seeing uh, uh, you know, from Latin Americans into this country. I mean, there's, a, there's an entire Latin American nation living in, in this country that creates uh, all sorts of very strong ties between the region and mm -hmm. the U.S. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why I think it's, it's really silly to think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, China trying to establish some kind of hegemony over the region. I think for, for good or ill, Latin America is bound to the, to the U.S. and not just to Washington as a government, but right. to the American society in a, in, a, in a way that China will never be able to replicate. Thank you. Well, I've got a, um, a, a question here, Professor. You know, um, President Obama has been quite vocal in his criticism uh, of some uh, Latin American leaders. Now, for example, I want us to listen to what he had to say uh, shortly after taking office about Venezuela's President Hugo Chavez. I have great differences with Hugo Chavez on matters of economic policy and matters of foreign policy. Uh, his rhetoric directed at the United States has been uh, uh, inflammatory. Uh, there have been instances in which we've seen uh, Venezuela uh, interfere with some of the uh, uh, some of the countries that surround Venezuela uh, in ways that I think are a source of concern. Now, Professor Michael Hart, of course, the dynamics haven't changed that much, and uh, uh, we had uh, Hugo Chavez calling uh, Barack Obama ignorant, and most recently alleging the U.S. is preparing to invade Libya. Um, the question is, can the U.S. president really win over Latin America unless he can win over some of his critics there? Right. I, well, I, I mean, I, with the first part, with um, the, the rhetorical exchange, in, which was actually much more intense before the Obama government uh, sure. between the, the, the Bush government and the Chavez government. It seemed to me a kind of theater that I find useless from both sides of uh, mm -hmm. this, this escalating rhetoric. Um, and I, I don't think in that sense also that, that Obama has to, uh, it's certainly not Hugo Chavez that he has to uh, win over. I, I mean, I think what, what he would have to win is in way, the way Kevin is suggesting is he would have to um, demonstrate that the U.S. is capable of, of acting as a uh, partner that, that, that allows and works with the democratic experiments in Latin America that, that, don't, that, uh, that, don't, that don't attempt to interfere. I mean, Venezuela, mm -hmm. the, the Venezuela is the one country in the, in the recent years where uh, there was an attempted coup of the government, where the U.S., if, if was not materially involved in the coup itself, was at least uh, very welcoming of the coup, so it's, it's, it's. I would say it's not the the right um, country to focus on mm -hmm. for this question. I think much more important to focus on would be Ecuador and Bolivia mm -hmm. and 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 Brazil itself. Um, these are countries that are not always developing foreign policies that agree with the U.S. that that even have economic policies that work in the same direction, but are nonetheless really important and I think inspiring. Uh, democratic 
governments and developments. It's it, they're the kind of okay. um, governments that he would have to engage with. Mm -hmm. You'd like to add something to that? Yeah. Yes, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Professor Hart is, is saying. And I would add something else. I mean, to be entirely frank, if you, again, if you take a look at opinion polls in Latin America, uh, Hugo Chavez's stock is, um, is very much plummeting throughout the region. Um, you know, we can have a discussion back and forth about the merits and, and the problems of the, of the Bolivarian experiment in, in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that nowadays, most uh, most countries wouldn't, uh, and most governments wouldn't want to mm, to embrace uh, very closely uh, the kind of policies that Hugo Chavez is, is espousing. And I go back to one of my previous points. What we are witnessing in Latin America, regardless of the ideological origin of governments, is a set of policies which is very convergent in the center of the spectrum. That is about good governance, is about uh, good economic management and robust social policies. And that's being uh, touted and that's being uh, promoted from all sides of the spectrum. L let me ask you one thing then, um, uh, Kevin. The, we've got the, uh, an email that came in from Nairobi in Kenya. Yep. Ali Dol wrote in here saying, how will the recent Arab uprisings affect Barack Obama's stance on Latin America? And the reason I ask that is that there's, there's some parallels some people see. For example, the grassroots uh, mm -hmm. uprising in the Middle East, in the Arab world there. And yet you, uh, you've, and sorry, and a parallel also in yeah. Latin America, where you have indigenous people also rising up and, and demanding their rights. What I would say is that you shouldn't take those parallels too far because uh, for the kind of thing that we've seen in the Middle East to happen, you, you really need uh, to have a radical loss of legitimacy, which you don't really see in anywhere in, in Latin America, even in cases that some people might consider problematic, such as Venezuela or Nicaragua, where there has been an encroachment on, on, on checks and balances and things like those. Uh, the numbers uh, um, that you see in terms of people supporting the democratic regime and being satisfied with it are very, very high indeed. So I don't foresee a repetition of what has happened in the Middle East happening anywhere in Latin America. Okay. Yet, with these things, you never know. <laughs> Professor, uh, if an email, if I may, right. sir, and you can add, add your comments in a second, but this email that came from the USA, from Alex uh, Cilio, is interesting. It makes a point about uh, the US, uh, US's position. It says, the U.S. needs to stop its one-size-fits-all approach to Latin America. The insistence on democracy is not enough. Obama must begin to fine-tune his approach to each country in Latin America. Your view on that? It doesn't, I mean, I, I, it's, it's definitely true that, um, that one has to recognize the vast differences of, of different countries in Latin America. There are also the, the different populations, in different indigenous populations, <coughs> different problems. I, I agree with that part. I, I'm not sure, though, that the um, that fine tuning of the foreign policy is, you know, to to each one is what is what is really needed with um, the U.S. I, I would say a much uh, a, a completely different approach of of the of the power relationship is what is what it needed and the kind of partnership. When Kevin said before, I think is an important recognition that that the U.S. needs Latin America more than Latin America needs the U.S. The the what's really new is the possibility and development of autonomy and, and, and autonomous political developments in Latin America. Okay. That seems to me the more fundamental arrangement. Uh -huh. And could I add, Riz, the one, I, I would add to what Kevin said before where I agree that we're not going to see a spreading of what's been happening in, in, in North Africa and, and the Middle East to Latin America, but I think the parallels are actually quite strong with right. developments 10 years ago in Latin America with what's happening now in the Middle East. Right. I mean, Professor, in 2001 in Argentina, Right. overthrow of governments one after another. I, unfortunately, I have to uh, stop you there only because we've got so much to okay. discuss on this huge topic, but uh, we Great. never have enough time. But I thank yes. you and very much, uh, Kevin Casas no, thank, thank you so very much, much as well, sir. Good to have you both on the show. Great, thank thank you, you for joining us too. Now remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what's been uh, going on there. You can uh, give us your feedback on the show and post your questions and comments. On the next show, the debate over nuclear power, as fears of lethal radiation from Japan's nuclear plant mount, what arguments are being put forward for and against atomic energy, and what are the alternatives? Make sure you tune in for that. For me and the team, we'll see you next time.